Abimelech. He had a wife called Naomi. He had two sons, Malon and Chilon. And these two sons had to, uh, married. The name of the first was Orpah. The second one was Ruth. And look at verse 4. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelled there about 10 years. Then after some time, Naomi lost her husband. After some time, she lost her sons. After some time, she was just left with alone with her daughter and she decided to move. Look at verse 6. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Now, the nun said they will go with her. Verse 8. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as he have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice, and wept. And she persuaded them to go back. Verse 11, um, he says, and Naomi said, turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb? That they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I'm too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope. If I should have an husband also tonight. And should also be your sons. Will you tarry for them that they will be grown? Will you stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieved me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. In verse 15. No, verse 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Oprah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. In verse 15. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her God. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Let's all read verse 16 together. One to read. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Verse 17 again. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught be dead, part thee and me. That was a resolute statement. A very resolute statement. She made that statement with that understanding that she was going to remain with the mother-in-law. She was not willing to change. And we're looking at the message, Ruth, harnessing life challenges for spiritual growth. Did she pass through challenges in life? Oh, yes. Did she have difficulty in life? Oh, yes. Did she suffer, will I call it, uh, uh, well, um, um, loss of husband at a tender age when she got married? Oh, yes. But how was she able to overcome all this? And despite these challenges, despite this difficulty, Ruth grew. Ruth became strong. Ruth became very firm and steadfast. How was she able to do all this? And that's what we want to discuss now. And that's what we want to see. And I pray that God will give us that grace and that strength that we will be steadfast and will continue steadfast in truth and in righteousness in Jesus' name. I told us in the message which we started about the case of Ruth that Ruth, she had various difficult time in her life and i gave us a preamble to make us understand that challenges come in different form it comes in different in different facets it comes in terms of right uh, financial crisis right come in terms of career problem in terms of fair treatment treatment in terms of uh, difficulty with french or relational issue and these challenges come and the, 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 the goal of these challenges is to distract us from following God. The goal of these challenges is to derail us, to destroy us, 
or to damn our soul and to lead us astray. That is the purpose of that challenge. Now, uh, looking at it, we've looked at the case of Joseph previously, David, Ruth, Abraham, and uh, Esther will be the subsequent one we are going to look at. So we're looking at this one, Ruth, and we have looked at some aspect about Ruth's life. We looked at her loss, her failure, and other things she has experienced. All this ones, I'm just keeping them true because we discussed them last week. She had setbacks in terms of work-related setbacks, right? In terms of emptiness in her life, right? Crisis, both material crisis and financial crisis. All these things are things that you can link to any human being, whether in America or in Africa, in Asia. All these crises, sometimes they experience them. They experience all these crises. And so, looking at the case of roots, we looked at the message under three subheadings. The first one was the painful and difficult plight of this woman called Ruth. Her painful plight, her difficult plight, all that she passed through. And we also looked at the persistent and daring pursuit of a Moabites. Now, how was she able to persist despite the challenge she experienced? And thirdly, we're going to look at the pertinent and daunting picture. We've looked at number one. And we started number two. So it's my intention to finish number two and number three in the message today. Right? Uh, looking at number one, what we have difficult problem, what we have painful problem. She lost her husband very early. We call her early widowhood. Number two, we say she was a Moabites. Moabites. That's where we were. And as a Moabites, what does it mean to be a Moabites? We read to us in Deuteronomy chapter 23, right? And in verse 3, how everything dovetailed. Our side of scripture this morning gave us the origin of that people called Moab. Gave us the origin of those people called the Ammonites. In Deuteronomy, open your Bible to 23 verse 3. It says, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord, even to their tenth generation shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever? And that's where Ruth came from. She was a Moabites. You know the reason why God said they will not enter? Because of their wickedness against their children of Israel. And because also look at also the antecedent, where they came from. Now despite all this, we observe that Ruth was not moved. She had what they call generational alienation. She also passed through distress. She had distressful adversities. In Ruth chapter 1 verse 4 and 5, we are made to understand her father-in-law died. After her father-in-law died, her brother-in-law died. Her own husband also died too. She passed through those stressful situations. Then when she came to Israel, there was no food, no sustenance. Look at Ruth chapter 2 verse 2. You see, and Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And they said, Go, my daughter. I told us that those who go to glean, right, are those who are the very lower end of the ladder, the lower, lower class. They don't have any means of sustenance. The little grains that fall left and right, that's what they rely on. And for Ruth, there was no future for prospect marriage. The mother-in-law told her, he said, come, now, now I'm a Ruth, an opera, there's no chance of you getting a husband through me. I don't have a son. Even if there's a chance, a slim possibility that I'm going to remarry again and give birth to a son, will you wait for that son to grow up and become old enough for you to remarry? The hand of God is against me. Biologically, it's not possible for me to conceive and have a child again. And so there's no prospect yet. You see, Ruth said, Mama, I will follow you. Where you die, I will die. Where you are buried, I will be buried. Your God shall be my God, and your people shall be my people. That was the case of uh, Ruth, right? Uh, she had a, also a very poor mother-in-law. The woman is very poor, as poor as a church rat. Although some church rats are very fat because there's biscuits for them to eat. But she's very, very poor. She had nothing to fall back to, Right? And yet she hung on with this woman. She stayed with her. She said, Mama, I will follow you. 
Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. Where you die, there also will I die. Right? She was, her mother-in-law was devastated by misfortune. So much that when she came into Jerusalem and they say, is this Naomi? He said, no, it's not Naomi. My name is Mara. For my life has been bitter because of all I've experienced and I've passed through. As if one to six was not enough, she was also a stranger in the land. Look at Ruth chapter 2 verse 6. Everybody knew that she's a stranger. Right? How uncomfortable you can be when you go to some place. They say, where are you from originally, originally? Right? And they look at you. They, they, even if you have spent 20 or 30 years, they still see you as a stranger. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, and the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is, it is the Moabitish themselves that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. They didn't say that she's a Jewish woman. No. She's a Moabitish. They even link her to her ancestry, where she came from. So if you look at all these things, it's enough. I tell one to seven, it's enough to make her to fail. Right? It's enough to, to bring her down. And also, on top of this, she was discouraged from going to Israel. Naomi said, you can't go with me. Don't go with me. What are the reasons Naomi advanced? Number one, Naomi said that I release you to go and remarry. It's not Ruth that says I want to go and remarry. Lest she be seen as insensitive. Lest she be misconstrued as a woman that is carefree and careless. Mama said, Ruth, I release you. Go and remarry. Naomi said, Oprah, both of you go and remarry. They are giving practical and rational reasons why they should go and remarry. There's no possibility of you getting a husband through me. There's no possibility of you getting a husband when you go to Israel. Those people are very, well, I call it, a, uh, 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 very selective. They are religious bigots there. Because you are a Moab Moabitish, they know that if they marry you, your children cannot enter into the congregation of God. They will not marry you. So there's going to be very strong, both spiritual prejudice against you, racial prejudices against you. So, Ruth, there's no prospect of you coming with me to Jerusalem. Also, he told her that she commended her into God's care. She prayed for her in verse 9. What a wonderful way to turn back on Naomi and go back. In verse 9, she prayed for her and said, The Lord grant you that ye may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. What else do you need? Just to pack your bag and say, Mama, bye-bye. Thank you for praying for me. I cannot go on my own now. But no. Ruth says, no, I'll still go with you. Also, we, we also see that the practical reality was presented before her. Number one, I'm too old. I can't have any child. Age factor is there, Right? There's no possibility that you're going to have even a, 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 a child through me. And divine providence is also working against me. She said, even God himself is even bitter against me. How will you want to go with a woman that says the favor of God has departed from my life? And Ruth, look at Naomi. Though you say you are old, though you say that the hand of God is against you, though you say the favor of God is against you, I want to still follow you. The question is, what did Ruth see in Naomi that make her to hold on to Naomi that is going to follow her? And these are the things that help her to overcome her plight and overcome the challenges and other difficulty. Then after she had given her all these points, right? She now come to verse 14 in Ruth chapter 1 verse 14. He now told her and they lifted up their voice and they they, they, they wept and Opa kissed her mother-in-law and went back. Opa now said, Mama, you make sense. Practically, there's no husband for me in Israel. Mama, you make sense. The age factor is there against me. Mama, what you're saying is true. Right? There's, I can see the hand of God is against you. Because if the hand of God is not against you, how can you lose your husband, you lose your sons, and you're alone? I don't think I want to work with this person and have negative energy. I want to go away from you, Mama. 
I'll go away, completely away from you. And we see the woman told her in verse 15, look at verse 15, and said, Behold, your sister in law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return with, alongside with your sister in law. Rational decision he told her, This makes rational sense for you to go back. But Ruth says, No, Mama, I'm not going to go back. And she was now faced with a very hard decision. Hard decision. Look at that verse 16. My brothers and sisters, that's what's going to make you to excel in your Christian work with God. You look at hard decision and look at it in the light of God's word and take up that decision. In verse 16, she made a famous statement. And Ruth said, entreat me not to leave thee or to turn, return from following thee after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. That was Ruth for you. She made that affirmation that she was going to walk with God, that nothing is going to stop her. So the question is, how was, he, uh, how was she, Ruth, able to harness these challenges? right and grew with these challenges that take us to our second point the persistence and daring pursuit of a moabites i'll put the challenges in red and i will tell you what she did to overcome these challenges right her early widowhood how was she able to overcome dependence on god she totally, completely reposed her faith in God. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1, it says, Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travel with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, said the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4, he said, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shalt not remember the reproach of thy widowhood anymore. Amen. Everybody say, Amen. Amen. Look up, church. Listen to this. If you don't get anything, get this. When you are passing through challenge in life and difficulty in life, look for the word of God. What does God say concerning my situation? Once you get a promise from the word of God, hold on to that promise. Hold on firmly to that promise. No matter be your trials, the difficulty and the challenges, say, Lord, this is what you told me. And Ruth tends to click with that and understood that. Say, God, you see, I will forget my widowhood. How God would do that, I don't know. You trust God and leave the consequences to him. Put your trust in God. Leave the consequences to him. And let God be the one to guide you. Let God be the one to lead you and to direct you. So that's number one. Number two. But there's this sore point. Whenever she go, you say, look at that woman. What's her name? Her name is Ruth. You don't know her. She's a Moabitish. And look at that person. Oh, she, uh, they saw her again, maybe in the field, in the shop, buying. Oh, look, I saw that Moabitish woman in the shop. And she goes to maybe um, uh, the, the, the stream, the river, to get some water. I say, this is the Moabitish woman. And on, on, on Saturday, they are going to the synagogue. And everybody's going. She will stay back. She's not going. Uh, why are you not going? I'm a Moabitish woman. As a Moabitish woman, the Bible says that my 10th generation should not enter into the congregation of God. But how did she overcome this? She became a proselyte. Who is a proselyte? A proselyte is conversion. Somebody who gave her life to Christ. They embraced the Jewish religion. Grace was extended to her. And that grace broke generational curse. Generational curse was broken through faith in Elohim. Amen. Through our faith in God, generational curse will be broken in our life in Jesus' name. And that's the secret, church. 
you are passing through difficulty, passing through challenges, passing through trials in life, and the world is telling you this is what the textbook says, this is what the medical book says, and this is what the sociologist says, or entomologist, or the historical account of your life, but this is what grace says. Amen. Grace have given me victory. The grace of God gave this woman who is called a Moabites. She became a proselyte. She embraced the faith of the Jews. And God transformed and changed her life. Then the third adversity. How did she overcome it? These distressful adversities. This distress and this difficulty she was passing through. How was she able to overcome this distress? Through her faith in God. She lost her husband. She lost any means of livelihood. In Psalm 107 verse 29. Make, make a note of that in your Bible. Psalm 107 verse 29. You say he maketh the storm a calm. So that the waves thereof are still. Please note that in your Bible. God maketh the storm a calm. Are you passing through storm in your life? God will calm your storm in the name of Jesus. No matter the storm you are passing through. Financial storm. Spiritual storm. Academic storm. Health challenge. It's a storm. Anything that's going to make you feel very distressful and uncomfortable. And make you lose your sleep. It's a storm. And see the antidote to that storm in Psalm 107, 29. He said he make the storm a calm. So that the waves thereof are still. In Isaiah chapter 25 verse 4. Say, for thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat. Wow. When the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Did you see the deliberate word God used to secure us and to assure us? He says it's going to be a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy, a strength to those who are in distress, a refuge from the term of storm, a shadow from the heat. So, this capture any situation you are passing through. That scripture in Isaiah chapter 25 verse 4. And we see a practical example in Mark chapter 4 verse 37. In Mark chapter 4 verse 37, when the children of Israel were passing, uh, sorry, disciples were going through the Sea of Galilee, there arose a storm in the midst of the sea. And they became afraid. And they went and tapped Jesus. Say, Master, Master, carest thou not that we perish? The Bible says he arose. And looked at that storm and said, Peace be still. And there was a great calm. Any storm in your life, I pronounce peace of God into your family in the name of Jesus. Every storm that the enemy has brought into your family, I pronounce the peace of God into that family in the name of Jesus no matter what be the source of that storm the peace of god will override that storm in your life in your family in jesus name not only that ruth also experienced something else ruth also experienced something else what did she experience right distressful adversities right Still under that dispersion, uh, adversity, absolute trust in God. Right? She allowed providence to guide her. Let me show you something in Ruth chapter 1 verse 22. Please make a note of this. Ruth 1 22. See, God knows how to guide his children. When you read that verse 22, it may not make any sense to you. But look at, let's, let me read it together. Let's read, let's see. It says, so Naomi returned and Ruth and Moab, the Moabites, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem when? Are we there? In the, they came to Bethlehem when? In the beginning of what? Barley harvest. That's timely. Church? That's timely. Why didn't they come at the end of the harvest? Why did they come? Why did they come at, at the time of sowing the seed, planting? Timely. God spoke to Naomi. I said, Naomi, stand up and go. 
the time God spoke to her coincided to when they started harvesting barley. God went ahead of her to provide that food. So that when she get there, there will be no gap in terms of meeting their needs. That's number one. Number two, so that it was through that process of gleaning in somebody's field, she met Boaz. Can you see divine providence and timing? That's why we say you should pray. Don't, don't just wake up over now and just carry your children and say we are going to so and so play without seeking the face of God. Pray. Don't make choices. Don't make decisions without asking God to guide you. Pray. Let the spirit of God guide you. You know what the Bible says? The steps of the righteous are what? Are ordered by God. Did God order the steps of Naomi? To leave when? To go to Jerusalem at the beginning of barley harvest. So we see that. Absolute trust in God. Guide us, right? God, will, God guided them through divine providence. Then there's this aspect of no future prospects of immediately getting a husband. You know, sometimes some young women put the issue of marriage first in their life. They are working to marriage, marriage. I want to marry. <laughs> My biological clock is ticking. I'm 21, I'm 26, I'm 27, I'm 28, 29. I want to marry, marriage, marriage. You are missing the point. You are missing the point. The first thing is not marriage. The first thing is your relationship with God. Establish your relationship with God. Make it solid, make it strong. The Bible says that when the way of a man pleases the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. When your ways are right with God, those things you are looking for, God will bring it to you. In the home, those things you are seeking for, children, God will bring them. Establish your relationship with God and make that formidable. Her own, she was not putting that first. What did she do? She, she lived for a bigger cause. And she lived for a more noble cause. Live for a cause bigger than yourself. You know, some people live for, 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 for their belly. Right? What I will eat. What I will drink. And all the labor and all their labor for is their job, their job, promotion. I want to become this. I want to become this. Yes, that's fine. That's fine. But live for a bigger cause. Bigger than food, bigger than bread, bigger than water. And Naomi and Ruth came to a point and said, See, Mama, I'm living for a bigger cause. Mama, you are bringing about the issue of no child, no prospect of having children. I know that. Mama, you are bringing the issue of there's no practical reality of having children through you or through even the men that are there. I know that. But I'm looking at your God, your people. Your God shall be my God. Your people shall be my people. Where you die, that's where I want to die. Where you are buried, that's where I want to be buried. I'm living for a bigger cause. And talking about living for a bigger cause, the Bible tells us in Romans how we can live for a bigger cause. It tells us in Romans what we need to do. In Romans chapter, uh, chapter uh, 8, right? Uh, chapter 12 rather. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, that you present yourself as a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. As a living sacrifice. That's what God is asking us to do. Make your body a seed for the kingdom. A seed for the kingdom. Then this one, she was a stranger in the land. You know, sometimes that could work against you. Everywhere you go, you are not, you are not welcome. You are not received. They see you as different, right? How did she overcome this? How did she harness that challenge, that problem? And she was able to overcome that. Focus. Everybody say focus. Not just focus on anything. Some people focus is money. Some people focus is house, property. Some people focus is children. Some people focus is job. But Ruth's focus is God. God. She placed her focus on God. She looked away from what was written against her people. Oh, the Moabitish cannot enter into the congregation of God for, uh, for 10 generations. That's okay. 
But me, I'm looking on God. God can change my testimony. God will change your testimony in Jesus' name. Bet you must focus on God. She focused on God. How about discouragement? You know, sometimes the people around you who are supposed to help you become a source of discouragement to you. And they are discouraging you and discouraging you. No, you cannot do it. Oh, you don't have the ability. Oh, you cannot study that course. Oh, you are not intelligent. No, oh, this one is not meant for you. And they are discouraging you. How did she overcome that? By, the, by living a life of faith. A life of faith. Absolute faith in God. In verse 15, Mama said, Look at your sister in law has gone back. In her presence, Opa kissed Mama and said, Mama, you are making sense. You have prayed for me. You have released me. I'm going. Baba. He said, See, your sister in law has gone. Join her and go away. He said, Mama, I'm not going away. That I have a bigger cause to pursue. Your God will be my God. Your people shall be my people. Where you die, I will die. Where you are buried, I will be buried. Nothing, right? But death will separate you and I. And she was not dissuaded from coming to Israel. Right? And also, faith often sees the invisible. Faith often sees the impossible. Faith often sees the impracticable. Faith, the eyes of faith, also sees the unsurmountable. But the natural eye sees the visible. The natural eyes only op operate in the realm of the possibility. Oh, is it possible for me to jump from here to here? Yes, then I jump. Can I jump from here to here and not get sustained? No, I will not jump. That's the natural man. But faith sees the imp impossible, sees the impracticable and the unsurmountable that all these are possible. And that's what now in Ruth had. She had the eyes of faith. And she was dissatisfied with her idolatrous state. You see, I've seen my parents practice idolatry. In fact, I was reading a recent theologian, a commentator on this book of Ruth. He said that Ruth was probably one of the daughter of Eglon, that the king of Moab. She came from a royal family too. If that's true, that she's she's daughter of Eglon or descendant of the of Eglon, she came from that family. She actually had to overcome certain comfort in her home just to embrace poverty in the land she was going to. We also see that she resolved to follow the true God and she was determined, determined that she was going to walk with God. And she burned all the bridges behind her. Everything. I'm not going back again. I want to be buried here. I'm not going back again. That's what she said. And, and, and she faced a hard decision. She was willing to make that hard decision to sacrifice her life. No matter what be the situation she was passing through, she said, this is what I'm going to do. And we say that though she faced that hard decision, she was willing to make her life a seed, a living sacrifice. That's what the Bible tells us. Then finally, on that point, look at the shame. The shameful realities that faced her. What are those shameful realities? She came to the land, no food. Mom, the mother-in-law poor. The family is poor. Nobody to, find, to, to, over, to, to give her food or sustenance. How did she overcome this? What quality did she use to be able to grow? Humility. Everybody say humility. It's her humility that opened the door for her. Her humility to stoop low. She didn't say, well, I come from a royal home. How can me with PhD be doing this kind of job? This person that is even commanding me is a school start holder. No, she was humble. Right? And she went to that field. I was picking, right, the leftover grains that were falling down. And she walked from morning, from sunrise to sunset. After threshing it, she just get maybe a bowl full. And she go the following day again. And she came back the first day. He said, Mama, they give me bread to dip into soup with them. I, I brought some portion for you. And they rejoiced and they ate that little portion. She didn't say, Mother-in-law, you brought me to suffer like this. No, she was humble. Humble yourself in the sight of God and he will lift you up. The way up, right, is the way, the way down is the way up. Though your beginning be small, your later end shall greatly 
improve and increase. And we see finally, the, what are the lessons we need to learn from this? Number one lesson, filial love. Ruth loved her mother-in-law. Many a time they say mother-in-law and daughter-in-law do not go together. They fight themselves. But Ruth and Naomi, we are an exception. And our mothers here, may God give you daughter-in-law that, that will love you and you will love her too in Jesus' name. But you discover that it was Naomi that sowed that seed of love. Isn't it? Naomi sacrificed for this woman. Sacrificed. And mother, mothers here, do the same thing for your daughter-in-law. Sacrifice for them. I know it's painful for your son that was close to you and go away from you. And that woman is taking that person. That affection has been taken away from you. Yes, it's part of the process. When Boaz came to marry Naomi, Naomi was not jealous and said, ah, if this woman goes to marry someone else, who will be feeding me? Who will be taking care of me? No. She was the one that initiated the process for Ruth to get a husband. So be selfless. In your selflessness, God will bless you. So that's num lesson number one. Filial love. Another lesson we see industry. This woman was hardworking. Ruth was hardworking. She was very, very hardworking. She was not lazy. We also see that she was also filial obedience. She was obedient to Naomi. Anything Naomi tell her to do, she would do. Uh, go and spread your skirts by that man. She said, ah, Mama, how can I do that kind of thing? A man should be looking for me, not me looking for a man. He said, go and do it. Filial obedience. She did that and she spread her skirt there. I said, play the role of the king, near kinsman to me. And, she, and everything just fell into place. And also we see a spotless name. Ruth chapter 3 verse 11. A spotless name. It says, and now my daughter, fear not. I will do to thee all that thou requires. For all the city of my people don't know that thou art a virtuous woman. Sisters, brothers, the world is reading you. Do you have a testimony that you are a Christian? Do you have a testimony that you are a child of God? Keep that spotless name. That's what she, these are the lessons we have. We're going to stand on our feet now to pray. That, and these are your prayer points. That God will help you that you walk by faith and not by sight. The Lord will strengthen you. Ask the Lord, give me the grace. I walk by faith, not by, by sight. In my choices, I will not choose like Lot. I will choose like Ruth. Lot, look at the well-watered plains, well-watered gardens of Sodom and pitch his tent near Sodom. Can everybody sit down, please? Ushers, ushers. Everybody sit down, please. Ruth didn't choose by faith. Ruth, sorry, didn't choose by sight. She chose by faith. She allowed it. Sorry, sorry, not you. I'm talking about those who are going to the, to the what do you call it? To the, the tea table. To the tea table. They are going to the tea table. I want the ushers to tell them to come up from the tea table. Let's pray. That God will help us that we walk by faith and not by sight. Right? Walk by faith, not by sight. That you will be able to let the Holy Spirit guide you in your decisions of life. Not the flesh, not the society. The Holy Spirit will guide you in your decision of life. Lord, allow the flesh to guide him. Lord, allow the, the society to guide him. Lord, allow existentialism, the things of the moment to guide him. But roots allow the Holy Spirit to guide her. Ask God to help you. Don't be swayed by what you see. Don't allow the things you see to change you, to affect you, to affect your life. That you'll be moved by the word of God. That God will give you grace. God will give you strength. God will give you the power to walk in obedience to his voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Our blessed Lord, we thank you because 
of your message, the life of Ruth, who turned her tragedy to a strategy in a positive way. I pray, Father, the grace to be focused like Ruth you give to us in Jesus' name. The determination to depend on you you give to us in Jesus' name. Humility may be required, Father. Give us grace. Lord, we are praying. We are asking where there is need for hard working and for obedience. Help us, Father, to be obedient children in Jesus' name. Give us grace to overcome. That your name will be glorified. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.